Good evening all. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. Tonight, before we get to the usual business of stories and history and prehistory, uh, we have the sad duty of remembering There's a solitary candle lit. For uh, for our dear friend Kelly, who only this night last week was sending us her love. through the uh, the wonderful medium of the technology that allows us to gather anyway I was preparing for this didn't realize it turned into a bumbling mess Kelly Edmiston is somebody who I actually didn't know very well, but she had the peculiar honour of being one of the very few regular Live Myths viewers who I actually met in real life and who I came to know. Uh, I think it was 2006, if not 2007, when Kelly uh, came into the offices of the Drogheda Leader, where I worked at the time. And she wanted me to sign Island of the Setting Sun, which she had just purchased. She struck me then and has struck me ever since as a person who was absolutely full of the joys of life. A very happy, vivacious, gregarious, outgoing, loving, tender, caring person. So... I just wanted to say a few words. Didn't realize it'd be so difficult. So that she would know that, you know, that she's missed and that she has a, a, a virtual family. I was going to do some reading. I'm not sure I'm going to be able. <laughs> Kelly, please forgive me. So I wanted to read. I hope there are two things that I want to read, and I hope you think that they are apt. And again, with apologies, if you've just tuned in and you haven't a clue what's going on. One of our regular viewers at a long time follower of Mythical Ireland and a long-time friend, Kelly Edmiston, passed away tragically in her home in Paisley in Scotland last Tuesday, a day after she had last tuned in to Live Irish Myths. Um, I'll tell you what very little I know about Kelly. Kelly is from New Orleans. She was very involved in the music scene there, I think particularly the jazz scene. She was tremendously supportive of musicians. If you look on her Facebook page, there are lots of tributes to her. 
uh, from the people of New Orleans. She left there after Hurricane Katrina and she came to Ireland. I know that she had intended to move on from Scotland as soon as the COVID-19 situation had calmed down and she was intending to go to mainland Europe. I can't, I can't remember exactly where she told me. Um, anyways, look, she won't get that chance now, but we wish her the very best in her onward journey. And we would want her to know, wouldn't we, that we hold her in our hearts. So just a little bit of reading. The first is from Benedictus, a book of blessings. Uh, and that's from the late John O'Donoghue, the author of Hanum Kara. Though we need to weep your loss, you dwell in that safe place in our hearts where no storm or night or pain can reach you. Your love was like the dawn brightening over our lives, awakening beneath the dark, a further adventure of color. The sound of your voice found for us a new music that brightened everything. Whatever you enfolded in your gaze, quickened in the joy of its being. You placed smiles like flowers on the altar of the heart. Your mind always sparkled with wonder at things. Though your days here were brief, your spirit was alive, awake, complete. We look towards each other no longer from the old distance of our names. Now you dwell inside the rhythm of breath as close to us as we are to ourselves. Though we cannot see you with outward eyes, we know our soul's gaze is upon your face. Smiling back at us from within everything to which we bring our best refinement. Let us not look for you only in memory where we, where we would grow lonely without you. You would want us to find you in presence beside us when beauty brightens, when kindness glows and the music echoes eternal tones. When orchids brighten the earth, darkest winter has turned to spring. May this dark grief flower with hope in every heart that loves you. May you continue to inspire us, to enter each day with a generous heart, to serve the call of courage and love until we see your beautiful face again. In that land where there is no more separation, where all tears will be wiped from our mind and where we will never lose you again. And the other is from the cry of the Sabbath, and I really hope that you find this appropriate. And the, if, if there's anything even slightly derogatory in this, it's not aimed at one person. It's just about the fallibility of humankind in, in, in general. <clears throat> A man does not know the folly of his, his existence and of the brevity of his short stay here and that the greatest bounty of life is acceptance and forbearance and the experience of love, not the treasure that he seeks to dig for himself out of the deep quarries of the earth. For each of you will come to your last moment. Alas, from this fate I seem to have been spared. This is the Sebok who is uh, the ever-living hawk of Irish mythology. And in the drawing of your final breaths in this world, you will contemplate even briefly your achievements of note in your short time here. And many of your kin will reach that moment with a great sadness and a profound regret, remembering that while they took much from life, they did not really live it to the fullness of its glory, and that they accepted material reward in substitute for the ultimate reward of a complete soul journey and the true and fulsome love that each person deserves. 
if I could wish one thing for mankind, it is this. That he could live a complete life, true to his path, and experience love and honour and loyalty to the fullest measure, so that his cup overflows with the joy of existence, and that each person would be a standard bearer for the very best human qualities. And if such an existence is one that is perhaps short of material fulfilment, I would wish that each one of you had the wisdom and the joy not to consider that a burden or a failure of any kind. The absolute love of your family and community and the sharing of life's manifold bounties would more than make up for such a deficiency. And I would wish that each and every one of you could come to your final moment with exhilaration for a wonderful life, lived true to the best qualities of humanity. And Kelly, you certainly did that. And in the drawing of your last breath, that you would be filled with the joy of completion and fulfilment and of a life well lived and of an earth left in good health for your descendants to enjoy. Each of us, each of you, deserves a wonderful crescendo of love at the culmination of your time here. My earnest hope is that in your final moment, you will be firmly content with the journey you have made through life and fulfilled in the deepest parts of your soul. And that as you close your eyes one last time and your heart gives out its last beat, that you hear a wonderful music from the other world and that a brilliant light opens towards you and envelops you and that a host of fairies comes skipping along gleefully to bring you cheerfully and willingly to that fantastic realm that we call Chirinog. <laughs> Let's go to one minute of silence for Kelly. Some of you will, excuse me, pardon me, I'm very sorry. Some of you will remember that uh, some of Kelly's last comments to the Midblix to uh, were filled with great love and love hearts. She told us she loved us. That's the kind of person she was. Kelly, we'll never forget you. And I'm going to leave the candle there. I'm going to turn on some lights. Clean up my face. So, um, welcome to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy. Uh, it's not often, thankfully, that I have to deliver some sort of eulogy to a person. As you can see, I'm uh, not that good at it. Tonight, I wanted to I wanted to talk about Lock Crew. Um, in particular, how Lock Crew came into sort of 
um, sort of popular, when it first, you know, came into popular view in the 19th century, that was primarily as the result of the work of two, what we might call antiquarians. It's very difficult to refer to anybody who's involved in uh, archaeology in the 19th century in Ireland as, as a proper archaeologist. It is with great regret that we have to say that, you know, we would love if Conwell, in digging some of the cairns at Loch Crewe, had left something for the future archaeologists. R.A.S. McAllister, uh, when he excavated, pardon me, um, at Carrow Keel in Sligo in 1911, did leave the bones that he found. Now, they were lost for a time, but they were recovered again in DNA studies and carbon dating was carried out on them, which is very important. Unfortunately, I don't think we have the same with Loch Crew, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, Loch Crew, Sliavna Kalia would be the famous of the hills, but it's a range, just in case you don't know, we've spoken about it often. There's a range of hills in Mead. It's about, uh, again, typical Irish thing. It's about a 40 minute drive from the Brunabonia monuments, maybe three quarters of an hour of a drive. It's over in the far northwestern corner of County Meath. Um, it's a really, really spectacularly beautiful landscape. One gets the impression at Loch Crew that it's a halfway house, basically, between the monuments of Sligo and those of Brunabonia. Sligo, they're higher up again. The, the, the hills, the mountains are higher. Queen Maeve's Cairn and Knocknaray, and you have... Uh, uh, Caro Keel on the Brickleave Mountains. And, you know, it was always said that, you know, there was a migration from the west to the east and that it developed as it went. And I think the science is slowly proving that. The Sligo dates are earlier. The oldest date we have for a Neolithic monument in Ireland is from uh, Poolna Brown in County Clare, the Dolmen, where there's a, a carbon date of uh, 3800 BC. And that would be a six five, six centuries before Nowth and Newgrange uh, and Douth. So it's uh, perhaps uh, perhaps the case that uh, history is, uh, or the, the science is slowly proving everything. Um, we'll see. It's as if, it's, it's as if the people who had built the Carrow Keel monuments arrived in, in, in uh, Mead and said, hmm, what can we do to sort of make this more special and engraved a lot of the stones with megalithic art, megalithic art, which is something you don't see very much of. In fact, there's very, very little of it in the Sligo monuments. And they were on their way towards the Boyne Valley where, of course, everything would culminate and reach this grand crescendo, you know, this grand uh, apex in terms of the monumental styles, uh, the monumental sizes, and of course, the, the uh, flourishing uh, megalithic art. But before Conwell, uh, Eugene Conwell was a, a local man, he was a mead man. Before he excavated, we knew very, we knew precious little about Loch Crew, and sure nobody really in those days that didn't have the a, attraction that they have today. In fact, even a generation ago, I mean, it was Martin Brennan and Jack Roberts and, and their team, Hank Harrison and, and all those who brought attention to Loch Crew by revealing the absolutely stunning uh, equinox alignment of Cairn T there. Uh, prior to that, the locals always knew these monuments were there, but they didn't, um, you know, they didn't, I, d I don't know, they didn't have the fascination that we have today for monuments. They just I suppose just took it for granted that they were there uh, and one just wonders how much of the modern fascination with monuments is to do with you know is, is a post-famine thing you know that we realize that we've we've we had to leave the island in so so such great numbers and that we were leaving the homeland behind and you know a lot of Irish people went to America for instance where you know there's uh, basically nothing that they can sort of immediately identify with in terms of ancient history, which they had on their doorstep when they were here in Ireland, you know. Um, and it's interesting because Conwell's claim to fame, apart from excavating some of the monuments and making a bit of a mess of one or two of them, um, is 
that he claims to have discovered the tomb of the Olaf Fola, uh, the, uh, the, or the, the chief poet. And uh, unfortunately, in sort of making that declaration, uh, he also poo pooed the notion, uh, which was contained in the local folklore, of course, that the hills were um, dedicated to the Kalyak. And in fact, she gave her name to Shlivna Kalya, the hill of the, the, the Kalyak. Um, there's no sort of real right or proper translation of Kalyak, as you know. As you know, one could say um, a veiled one is a good one. Um, um, hag. But one wonders, is that a, a, a derogatory term? You know, um, anyway, we did an episode of Book Talk about the Book of the Kalyaks. It'd be very interesting uh, to go back on that one if you want to find out more about her. So I'm going to read a little bit from, uh, this is actually reprinted and it's called Old Stone Monuments, but originally it was called Rude Stone Monuments by James Ferguson. This was published in 1880, no, 18, 1870s, I think. Yeah, um, well, he, he has assigned the preface 1871. Yes, yeah, sorry. First published as Rude Stone Monuments by John Murray in 1872. So we'll do a bit of reading of Ferguson and see where it leads us. There'll be a little bit less mythology in this, but I think it's interesting to pursue it anyway. At a distance of 25 miles, nearly due west from Bruna Bowen. So as 25 miles... Uh, but as I say, 45 minutes by by road if you're traveling, which is the way we like to measure things here in Ireland, the distance, not the distance, but the time it takes you to get there. And two miles southeast from Old Castle is a range of hills called on the ordnance map Schlievna Kalia, the Hags or Witch's Hill. It is upwards of 200 feet above, oh, and I, I actually should apologize also um, for not doing the usual introductions Tonight, I thought that um, given the circumstances uh, of uh, our loss of one of our Tua, uh, Kelly, that uh, it would perhaps be more fitting to start in a sort of a somber, reflective uh, and a mood of remembrance uh, rather than the usual chirpiness. And uh, I think you can understand uh, why. It is upwards of 200 feet above the level of the sea and the most conspicuous elevation in that part of the country. That's true, too. I mean, their Lockrew Hills afford a, a fabulous panoramic view of the landscape in many different directions. On the ridge of this range, which is about two miles in extent, are situated from 25 to 30 cairns, some of considerable size, being 120 to 180 feet in diameter. Others are much smaller and some so nearly obliterated that their dimensions can hardly be now ascertained. It's an interesting thing that there were more cairns extant in the time of Conwell's work, which I think was probably the decade before the 1860s, I think. We'll come to that, though. We'll get the right date. That there were a lot more. I'd love to, I'd love to, be able to go back in time and see it. Well, I'd love to go back in time to the Neolithic and see it when it was finished, but um, I'd love to go back to the time of Ferguson and Conwell just to see how much more of it was standing then. Till seven or eight years ago, this cemetery was entirely unknown to Irish antiquaries, and the positions of the cairns were hardly even indicated in the Ordnance Survey. But in 1863, they attracted the attention of Mr Eugene Conwell of Trim. In the years 1867 to 68, there you go, he was en enabled with the assistance and cooperation of the late Mr. Napper, N-A-P-E-R, of Lock Crew, the proprietor of the soil, to examine and explore the whole of them. And of course, uh, Mr. Napper's descendants continue to, uh, to farm in the area to this day. A brief account of the results which he obtained was submitted to the Royal Irish Academy in 1868. Uh, probably a better furnishing of accounts than our friends at Douth in the 1840s. And we have spoken about that on a few occasions, Frith and his colleagues who left very little record of, of the uh, anything that did. Uh, 
Pat, uh, I'm just going to say, if you don't mind, and, and you're very welcome here, and, and, and I'm just, we're very de delighted to have so many people watching, but this is not about politics. Um, and I know that there's a lot of stuff going on in the United States, and my heart goes out to the people of the United States, but, but this forum is not for discussion of politics. So please, um, just if you can respect that, I'd be very grateful to you. There's plenty of places where, where, where we can talk about politics. People actually come here to get away from the troubles of the world. So I hope you can understand that. And afterwards, printed by him for private circulation in 1868. One, one might wonder in that. It's okay, Pat. That's okay. But just so long as you appreciate where I'm coming from, that's all right. Um, one, one could say, has, has much changed? Conwell published his, the results of his work at Loch Crew privately. But then a lot of archaeological work gets published in, they're not necessarily obscure um, um, publications and journals, but they're obscure from the point of view is that the public generally don't have immediate or easy access to them, you know? And actually, if you don't mind me saying, this is one of the functions of Mythical Ireland and always has been since I set up Mythical Ireland in the year 2000, 21 years ago in March. And that was to disseminate information to the public in a popular sort of forum in a way that, you know, I go into the, the books and the journals and examine the difficult language of the science and try to translate that into layman's terms, you know, um, and uh, has that has that's 152 151 years ago has has anything changed you know um it's not that excavation reports are published privately but depending on whether you're working for a private archaeological firm or a university they get published in so many different places pulling them all together is a very difficult job if you're not an academic you're not in a university library with, uh, you know, a peers who are able to say, oh, you're looking for information about Fulloch Thia, here's what you need. Or you're looking for information about Conwell's excavations of Loch Rue, here's the papers, you know. Um, and we, we don't have that luxury. It's a bit harder for us to find the information. But the greater work with plans and drawings in which he intends fully to illustrate the whole is still in abeyance owing to want of encouragement. Hmm. Apparently Conwell needed to be encouraged to... Uh, to produce his reports. When completed, it will be one of the most valuable contributions to our archeological knowledge that we have received of late years. Meanwhile, the following meager particulars are derived from Mr. Conwell's, Conwell's pamphlet and the information I picked up during a personal visit, which I made to the spot in his company in the autumn of last year. The illustrations are all from his drawings. By the way, the drawings are exquisite. I'd love to see the original plates for this. You know, there's a, a plan of Cairn T uh, with its cruciform passage and chamber. And you can see the little indent in the front of it there, very like Newgrange, where they, the entrance curves it. Well, I know the modern one does, but the ancient one did too. And the Hag's Chair, which is the singularly most remarkable curbstone of any Irish passage mount. One of the most perfect of these tumuli is that distinguished by Mr. Conwell as Cairn T. Now, Conwell was the one who came up with the lettering convention for Loch Crew. A similar lettering convention was used in Brunabonia, and before too long, they ran out of letters, which is why you have sites labelled, for instance, uh, A1 instead of, you know, with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They ran out of letters. Um, uh, Z, is it Z1 and Z2? Yeah. And then sites like LP1, LP2, you know. It stands on the highest point of the hill and is consequently the most conspicuous. What Ferguson fails to mention is that in the old Ordnance Survey maps, in fact, Cairn T was identified as the Kalyax Cairn. Uh, so um, good to see Desiree Riley is feeling better, by the way. Uh, the best of health to you, Desiree. It is a truncated cone, 116 feet in diameter at the base, and with a sloping side between 60 and 70 feet in length. 
Around its base are 37 stones laid on edge, varying from 6 to 12 feet in length. They are not detached as at Newgrange, but form a retaining wall to the mound. On the north and set about 4 feet back from the circle is a large stone, 10 feet long by 6 feet high and 2 feet thick, weighing consequently above 10 tonnes. The upper part is fashioned as a rude seat from which it derives the name of the hag's chair. And there can be little doubt but that it was intended as a seat or a throne. But whether by the king who erected the sepulchre or for what purpose, it is difficult now to say. Notice how he's, uh, hello, uh, Vicky and Evan and Chili. Uh, notice how he immediately defers to uh, the idea of power being held by the males. Uh, doesn't mention the females, you know. On the eastern side of the mound, the stones forming the periphery of the cairn curve inwards for eight or nine yards on each side of the spot where the entrance to the chamber commences. It is of the usual cruciform plan and 28 feet long from the entrance to the flat stone closing the innermost cell. The dome, consequently, is not nearly under the centre of the tumulus as at Newgrange. By the way, he was mistaken about that because the, the chamber of Newgrange is not uh, at the centre of the monument there either funnily enough, and lends something like probability to the notion that the cell at Douth was really the principal sepulchre. 28 of the stones in the chamber were ornamented with devices of various sorts, and that is quite spectacular. I mean, it is true of Cairn T that there's a, a, a huge mass of megalithic art. Uh, almost every stone is decorated, and you don't even see that uh, at uh, Brunagonia necessarily. Two of them are represented on the accompanying woodcut, which with the drawings on the hag's chair, give a fair idea of their general character. I'm going to show you that briefly, if I can. There are two of them. There's the, what we call the equinox stone. That's the one at the rear of the end recess, and there's one that's in the passageway on the, on the left-hand side as you're walking in. They are certainly ruder and less artistic than those on the Boyne, and so far would indicate an earlier age. Nothing was found in the chambers of this tomb but a quantity of charred human bones. See that even by that statement. It's like, well, what, what did you expect? Nothing was found in the chambers of this tomb, right, but a quantity of charred human bones. Perfect human teeth mixed with the bones of animals, apparently stags, and one bronze pin two and a half inches long, with a head ornamented and stem slightly so, and still preserving a beautiful green polish. And so you can immediately see that we're back in the realm of antiquarians, pre sort of proper archaeology and the proper uh, uh, tools and science of archaeology and methods. And we're basically looking for anything that shines. And immediately charred human bones are cast aside as something unworthy. Uh, and, and, and something irrelevant and of little value. Uh, and uh, if you were to give those bone fragments to today's scientists, Dr. Lara Cassidy and her colleagues, for instance, now, if they're cremated, there's not much we can do with them DNA-wise, uh, but they would still be able to tell us so much, you know. Cairn L, a little further west, is 135 feet in diameter and surrounded by 42 stones, similar to those in Cairn T. Cairn L is the one, uh, just in case you're wondering, on what's, what's today called Cairnban West, but was, was in older times called just Cairnban, which means the White Cairn or the White Cairns. Uh, it is the one that has this spectacular opening towards the sunrises at the beginning of winter and the beginning of spring where the sun shines in onto that slender limestone pillar. You might have seen, I shared some photographs of that uh, over the last, well, uh, probably a few times over the last few years. The same curve inwards of these stones marks the entrance here, which was, which is placed 18 feet from the outward line of the circle. The chamber here is nearly of the same dimensions as that last described, being 29 feet deep and 13 feet across its greatest width. In one of the side chambers lies the largest of the mysterious flat basins that have yet been discovered. Five feet nine inches long by three feet one inch broad, uh, the, the hole being tooled and picked with as much care and skill as if executed by a modern mason. So some interesting remarks there because the, the, the granite stone basin in Newgrange had to have been polished repeatedly uh, 
uh, you know, uh, over a long period of time before reaching its convex, uh, its concave, should I say, uh, sh shape. This is the image that was featured on the graphic for today's episode. And here is the basin. And here is the most decorated and the largest of the stones in the chamber of Kernel, which is on the right as you go in, not at the end, where the sun might shine in in the middle of October. And the slender pillar, which the sun strikes. Sorry, I'm looking at this. Am I looking at this the right way? I am, yes. And the slender pillar is that one, sorry, that the sun strikes at these particular moments of the year. And the reflected light of that gloriously lights up all the megalithic art on the stone behind. This one has a curious nick on its rim, but as it does not go through, it could hardly be intended as a spout. Till some unrifled tomb is found or something analogous in other countries, it is extremely difficult to say what the exact use of these great stone saucers may have been. That the body or ashes were laid in them is more than probable. And they may then have been covered over with a lid like a dish cover. Such are found in on tombs in southern Babylonia. Under this basin were found... Sorry, I should show you that picture. Yeah, somebody's mentioning reflected light. Let me have a look here. Uh, apologies for a moment while I get the island of the setting sun. Because... Or was it... No, 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 no. It's Mythical Ireland. I apologise. <laughs> I don't even know which book it is. This is the photo taken by my very good friend Martin Byrne. Martin runs the fabulous website carokeel.com and this is a photo taken sorry I'll show I'll, 5th of November 1997 the beginning of winter look at the sunlight striking this pillar look how dramatic this image is right and look at the way the reflected light lights up these beautiful carvings on the stone there it really is a dramatic um, moment it's almost like a play being acted out on a stage. There's something very clever about Kernel. It's like it does not function as you would imagine. You want, to, you want to think of it in terms of being a passage where the sun shines in at a certain day of the year right into the end chamber, which is what happens in Cairn T. <laughs> doesn't happen in Kernel. Something different, different time of year. And the unexpected happens. But it is true that that stone uh, behind the basin with all the engravings on it, that stone is the largest and most ornate of the, the wall stones um, inside Kernel. Now, where was I? Until this basin, sorry, under this basin were found great quantities of charred human bones and 48 human teeth. Besides a perfectly rounded cyanite ball, S-Y-E-N-I-T-E -E ball, still preserving its original polish, also some jet and other ornaments. Some of those, I actually must share with you later on the Mythical Ireland uh, page and on the community page, photos from the National Museum showing those balls from Loch Crew. I believe cyanite, somebody who's more knowledgeable could tell me perhaps, I think it's a form of chalk, is it? It's 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 a softer stone. It's not it's not like marble or, or or granite. In other parts were found quantities of charred bones. Some rude pottery. I love that word. It's rude is just a way of saying well we don't understand it, you know. And bone implements, but no objects in metal, which is a funny thing. Again, they're looking for metal objects in the eighteen hundreds. They don't understand that these monuments are pre-metallurgy, that they date from the Neolithic. They couldn't have known that back then. Uh, and, and so this bronze pin that they had found in Cairn T, two and a half inches long, uh, was probably the most exciting thing that they found from their point of view in Cairn T. But if you were to let a modern archaeologist in there, uh, they would think very differently. Another thing that has to be said about all this, and I've mentioned this previously, is that there's a sort of a, a terrible... Oh, there's a terrible sterilizing of the monuments when they're excavated and the removal of all the bones and the remains and a sort of a dehumanizing of it, you know. Um, and we know now in the case of, for instance, Carrow Keel, we know in the case of Newgrange and Nouth, those bones were lying there. Now, there wasn't much of left of them. I mean, they're fragments and charred remains, but 
they were lying there for 5,000 years and suddenly we come in and sort of almost vacuum clean the place out of it, you know. The woodcut representing the cell with large basin gives a fair idea of the general style of sculpture in this and the neighbouring cairns. The parts cross-hatched seem to have been engraved with a sharp metal tool, wrong, <laughs> possibly engraved with either a small piece of quartz or a piece of flint. The ordinary forms, however, both here and on the boin are picked, but whatever, whether they were executed with a hammer or picked direct or by a chisel driven by a hammer is by no means clear. My own impression is that it would be very difficult indeed to execute these patterns with a hammer of any sort and that a chisel must have been used. But whether of flint, bronze or iron, there's no evidence to show. It certainly wasn't iron. That wasn't to come for another two and a half, three, three thousand years. Um, and by the way, uh, our good friend, uh, Sheila Moylan uh, of the Mythical Ireland community, who is an artist, has spent quite a lot of time drawing and redrawing uh, some of the patterns on stones at Newgrange. And uh, she has some interesting things to say about, you know, this idea that this artwork is somehow primitive, you know. Um, so I'm just going to share that as a comment, the link to uh, Sheila um, wrote a guest blog post on the Mythical Ireland blog uh, about her findings, which are very interesting, I think you'll find. Karen H., now only between five and six feet in height and 54 feet in diameter, seems to have been the only one on the hill not previously rifled and yielded a most astonishing collection of objects to its explorer. The cell was of the usual cruciform plan, 24 feet from the entrance to the rear and 16 feet across the lateral chambers. In the passage and crypts of this cairn, Mr. Conwell collected some 300 fragments of human bones, which must have belonged to a considerable number of separate individuals. 14 fragments of rude pottery, 10 pieces of flint, 155 seashells in a perfect condition, besides pebbles and small polished stones in quantities. So 300 fragments of human bone uh, belonging to a considerable number of individuals, which suggests, does it? Maybe not. It's very difficult because we can't go back in time and we can't ascertain how long the cairns had been open to human intrusion and how much material had been carried away in the meantime so but even the very notion that there were 300 fragments in one of the smaller tombs does suggest that over time uh, a lot of people were interred in the cemetery at large the most remarkable part of the collection consists of 4,884 fragments more or less perfect of bone implements these are now in the Dublin Museum and look like the remains of paper knife makers stock in trade. Most of them are of a knife shape and almost all more or less polished, but without further ornamentation. But 27 fragments appear to have been stained, 11 perforated, 501 engraved with rows of fine lines, 13 combs were engraved on both sides, and 97, sorry, 91 engraved by compass with circles and curves of a high order of art. On one in crosshatch lines is the representation of an antlered stag, the only attempt to depict a living thing in the collection. And uh, our friend uh, and another Mythical Ireland follower, Lar Dooley, the artist, uh, has suggested uh, that those implements are not knives but they're rather what are they called is it bull rushers you know that they were tied to a string and swung around and they made this whirring noise in the air you know is everybody okay besides these and by the way if there's a stag engraved on it then you know it, it goes without saying that that is not a neolithic implement it is, is, it is likely much later. Neolithic people did not apparently uh, engage in representative art by and large. Besides these, there were found in this cairn seven beads of amber, three small beads of glass of different colours, two fragments, and a curious molten drop of glass, one inch long, trumpet shaped at one end and tapering towards the other extremity. Six perfect and eight fragments of bronze rings and seven specimens of iron implements but all as might be expected very much corroded by rust 
One of these presents all the appearance of being the leg of a compass with which the bone implements may have been engraved. And one was an iron punch, five inches long, with a chisel-shaped point bearing evidence to the use of the mallet at the opposite end. Cairn D is the largest and most important monument of the group, being 180 feet in diameter. And though it is very much dilapidated, the circle of 54 stones which originally surrounded it can still be traced. On its eastern side, the stones curve inwards for about 12 paces and form universal in these, sorry, in the form universal in these cairns. But though the explorers set to work industriously to follow out what they considered a sure find, they could not penetrate the mound. They did pretty much there what they had done, uh, what uh, Frith and his colleagues had done at Douth. They carved a great big gouge into the cairn, found nothing and left it as it was. So today, the pictures of Cairn D, and I'll try again if I can remember, maybe somebody should prompt me afterwards to share a picture of Cairn D from the air and you'll see this huge gouge cut into it, which is basically the result of Conwell's <clears throat> excavations, quote unquote, from the 1860s. The stones fell in upon them so fast and the risk they ran was so great that they were forced to abandon the idea of tunneling. And though a large body of men worked assiduously for a fortnight trying to work down from above, they failed to penetrate to the central or any other chambers. So to this day, Cairn D retains its secrets. It almost certainly, well, look, I wouldn't stake my poor reputation on it. Don't have much of a reputation. But anyway, uh, um, it is highly likely to have at least one passage and chamber in there. So that's great. That means that that is likely to be, again, quote unquote, available to future archaeologists who may... Uh, enter in there at some point in the future and find some very, very important uh, a human bone uh, DNA uh, carbon datable evidence. It still therefore remains a mystery if there is a blind tope like many in India or whether its secret still remains to reward some more fortunate set of explorers. If it has no central chamber, the curving inwards of its outer surface of stones is a curious instance of adherence to a sacred form. Uh, and I'm going to read on a little bit. It now only remains to try to ascertain who those were who were buried in these tumuli and when they were laid there to their rest. So far as the evidence at present stands, it hardly seems to me to admit of doubt, but that this is the cemetery of Talchen, so celebrated in Irish legend and poetry. And this is quoted from Petrie's Round Towers. The host of great Meath are buried, in the middle of the lordly brew. The great Oltonians used to bury at Tolchin with pomp. The true Oltonians before Conkobar were ever buried at Tolchin until the death of that triumphant man through which they lost their glory. And that is a very curious one about the Oltonians, uh, which are, you know, people from a, a part, a district of Ulster in the north of Ireland should bury their dead all the way, uh, so far away in uh, in Loch Crew, which is uh, associated as being the burial spot uh, or the burial place of Talchin that is mentioned in the myths. The distance of the spot from Telltown, the modern representative of Tal Talchin, is 12 miles, which to some might appear an objection, but it must be remembered that Brew is 10 miles from Tara, where all the kings resided who were buried there. And as Dahi and other of them were buried at Rathcrohan, 65 miles off, this distance seems hardly to be an objection. Of course, what we know now is that it was highly unlikely that the kings of Tara were ever buried at Bruna Bonia, or if they were, they were certainly buried at a much later date uh, than the monuments had been built, because the monuments were Neolithic and the kings are sort of Iron Age, early medieval. <coughs> and so to say that the proximity of Tara and Newgrange, or, or the lack of proximity, uh, could be used is a little bit objectionable. Telltown, in the modern Telltown, is almost certainly the location of uh, Tolche, as in the place where the games were held. Uh, the Tolchin games, which were held in honour of Lou, Lou's foster mother, uh, Tolche. Uh, but there is a separate place where she was buried, where, according to, I think it's the Dinshanicus, 
where uh, the trees were cleared and her cairn was built. And that sounds very much like the hills of Loch Crew. Indeed, among a people who, as evidenced by their monuments, paid so much attention to funeral rites and ceremonious honours to their dead, as the pagan Irish evidently did, it must have mattered little whether the last resting place of one of their kings was a few miles nearer or further from his residence. It must not, however, be forgotten that the proper residence of the Oltonians, who are said to be buried at Tolchin, was Emania, as it's spelt in the antiquarian texts, or Awan, Awan Macha, or Arma, 45 miles distant as the crow flies. Why they should choose to be buried in Meath, so near their rival capital of Tara, if that famed city then existed, is a mystery which is not easy to solve, but that it was so, there seems no doubt, if the traditions or books of the Irish are at all to be depended upon. Of course, in the case of certainly uh, one of the Cairns, uh, STU, Cairn U, uh, 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 as, as you may have previously seen in Mythical Ireland, the book, or if you might have read it on uh, one of my posts online, uh, points to Tara for the uh, uh, Samhain and in bulk sunrises. If their real residence was so distant, it seems of trifling consequence whether it was 10 or 12 miles from the place we now know as Telltown. There must have been <coughs> excuse me, some very strong reason for inducing the Oltonians to bury so far from their homes, but as the reason has not been recorded, it is idle to attempt to guess what form it took etc etc if this is so there is little difficulty in determining, determining who were buried here besides the testimony of the poem just quoted it is stated in the book of the cemeteries that is Shanachus Narelic at Talgin the kings of Ulster were used to bury Olaf Fola and his, with his descendants down to Honkobar who wished to be carried to a place between Slay, S-L-E-A, and the sea, with his face to the east on account of the faith which he had embraced. This conversion of Conchobar is one of the most famous legends in Irish ancient history. He was wounded in the head by a ball that remained there and was ordered by his physician to remain quiet and avoid all excitement as his only chance of surviving. For seven years he followed this advice, but when he saw the eclipse of the sun and felt the great convulsion that came over nature, the day that Christ was crucified, he turned to his druid and asked, What is this? To which Bakrach, the druid, replied, It is true indeed. Christ, the Son of God, is this day crucified by the Jews. At the recital of this enormity, Conchobar felt so indignant that he went nearly mad. His excitement was so great that the ball burst from his head and he died on the very Friday on which the crucifixion took place. All this may be silly enough, as the <laughs> electric telegraph was not then in use, but it is worth quoting here, as it seems that it was to establish this synchronism that the chronology of the period was falsified to the extent of half a century, at least. Well, that's a very telling uh, comment. Uh, on behalf of Ferguson. Uh, he, he was able to tell that there was some meddling going on with the old texts. Conchobar and Crimthon were the two kings of the two great dynasties then reigning in Ireland, whom the analysts strive to synchronise with Christ. And though they fail in that, they establish beyond much doubt that those kings were contemporaries. If to this we add the fact, so often repeated by the authorities quoted above, that Conchobar was the last of his race buried at Talchin, and that Crumthon was the first of his line buried at Brew, we obtain a tolerably clear idea of the history of these cemeteries. Eh, eh, no, we don't. Sorry, Mr. Ferguson, but uh, these cemeteries predate those characters by at least three millennia. Brew, in fact, succeeded to Talchin on the decline of the Oltonian dynasty and the rise of the Tua de Danon after the victories at Moitura had established their supremacy and they had settled themselves at Tara. And of course, he writes about the Tua de Danon as if they were a real people. The character of the sculptures in the two groups of monuments fully bears out this view. The carvings at Loch Crew are ruder and less artistic than those at Brew. They are more disconnected and oftener mere cup markings. And that's true, there's a lot of cup marks at uh, Loch Crew. The three stones represented in the preceding and following woodcuts are selected from a great many in the Conwell portfolios 
as fair average specimens of the style of sculpture common at Loch Crew, with the number 73 represented the Hag's chair, number 75 the chamber in Cairnell. I want to show you another one while I'm there. That's another stone with lots of cup marks in it in Cairn T. No animal or vegetable form can be recognised, even after allowing the utmost latitude to the imagination, nor do the circles or waving lines seem intended to convey any pictorial ideas. Beauty of form as a decoration seems to have been all the old Celt aimed at, and he may have been thought successful at the time, though it hardly conveys the same impression to modern minds. Ah, that old nugget, huh? What is the meaning of megalithic art? The graceful scrolls and spirals and the foliage of Newgrange and Douth do not occur there, nor anything in the least approaching to them. Indeed, when Mr. M when Mr. Conwell's book is published, in which they will all be drawn in more or less detail, I believe it will be easy to arrange the whole into progressive series illustrative of the artistic history of Ireland for the five centuries before the advent of St. Patrick. It's mad, isn't it? St. Patrick arriving in the fifth century AD uh, five centuries before that takes you to just around the time of Christ, you know. Like, no, these are a lot, lot older than that. If only we could go back and tell them. We wonder what they would think, huh? It would be an extremely dangerous line of argument to apply this law of progressive development to all countries. In India especially, it, it is very frequently reversed. The rudest art is often much more modern than the most refined. But in Ireland, this apparently never was the case. From the earliest scratchings on pillar stones down to the English conquest, her art seems to have been in unfalteringly progressive and beginning with these two cemeteries, which are probably the oldest incunabula of her art. Nice word. Its history might be written without a gap or halt till it bloomed in those exquisite manuscripts and crosses and works of gold and metal, which still excite such unqualified admiration. So there you go. There's James Ferguson. Just going to dip into, if I can find it for a moment, Conwell's. I want to talk briefly about Olaf Fola. A great deal has been made about Olaf Fola uh, by the British Israelites, and they will be the topic of a seri uh, series, an episode of Live Irish Myths forthcoming rather soon. So I won't say too much about them today, except for they they won't fare well in in my analysis of them just put it that way so if you're expecting me to uh, engage in conspiracy theories about uh, british israelism and the ark of the covenant and jeremiah and all that uh, maybe you want to look somewhere else uh, paul is looking for that wonderful word it is Incunabula, I-N-C-U-N-A-B-U-L-A, U-L-A, Incunabula. Google search. A book or pamphlet or broadside printed in Europe before the 16th century. Incunabula are not manuscripts, which are documents written by hand. This is Wikipedia, so take it with a pinch of salt. Anyway, you can do your own. Yes, you can do your own Googling on that one. We have the spelling correct anyway. Um, so I want to just read what Conwell says about the tomb of the Olaf Fola. And Olaf Fola basically means the poet of Ireland, or the chief poet of Ireland. Um, And this is an account of the the, uh, the fair of Talchin or the assembly, the Enoch of Talchin uh, from the Book of Lecan. Talchin, why so called? Answer, Talchu, daughter of my moor, the wife of Yochi Garav, son of Doach Temin. It was by him, Doan O'Neill, at the tower, that's Tara, was made Doan O'Neill being the man of the hostages. And she was the nurse, foster mother, of Louis, son of Skal Balov. And it was she that requested her husband to cut down Kyle Cohen, that it should be an Einach, a fair or assembly place around her lecht or grave. 
Lacht, L-E-A-C-H-T. It's an old Irish word for a grave or a gravestone. And she died on the calendar of August after that. And her guba, lamentations, G-U-B-A or guba, and we've come across that word, haven't we, in the Dinshanicus of Nauth. Chno guba, the, lament, the nut lamentation, this strange ritual carried out by Angus after Englec had been taken by Midger. Anyway, let's not get distracted. Um, and her go- Guva lamentations and her Nosad, N-O-S-A-D, games or funeral rites, were celebrated by Lou. 500 years, moreover, and 3,000 before the birth of Christ, this occurred. And this fair was made celebrated, made in brackets celebrated, by every king who occupied Erin till Patrick came. Isn't that incredible that they're saying that it was three and a half thousand years before Christ that these uh, games were inaugurated, which uh, would uh, put them right into the Neolithic when all of the things were happening around them, around the, the uh, monumental architecture uh, and the construction uh, of Lochru and Brunabonia. Helen is in the house. Royal Highness, very nice of you to join us. A little bit late, Mom, but we shan't question you as to your tardiness because that would be impolite, rude. Um, and 400 years it continued to be celebrated in Tolchin from Patrick to the Black Fair of Donacha, son of Flam, son of Mael Shachlan. Mael Shachlan was the king of Ireland in around 1000 AD, around 1000 years ago. Three prohibitions were upon Tolchin, namely to pass, this is a gyasa, uh, or, or a, a, yes, a prohibition or a, oh, the word's not coming to me. It's just been one of those evenings. Um, namely, to pass through it without a lighting. Taboo. That's the word. To see it over the left shoulder and to throw a cast which does not take effect in it, of which it is said as follows. Uh, yes, the calends of August would exactly indicate Lunasa is right, ArchDB. We would say the 1st of August nowadays, but before the uh, introduction of the Gregorian calendar, long, long before such things, we adhered to a much older calendar. You nobles of the land of Comley Con, listen to us for our blessing till I relate to you the ancient history of the origin of the fair of Talchu, and that is Enig Talchin. So I prefer to call it an, an Enoch or an assembly. A fair doesn't really describe it too, too well. Tolchu, daughter of renowned Mai Moor, wife of Yuchi Garov, son of Doch Dal, was thither brought by the Fir Bullock host to Kyle Cohen after a covalent battle. Kyle Cohen, tall and stately were its trees, extended from Eshkir to A Nromon, from Mona Moor, uh, that would be Mona, M O N A D, but the D would be Lenited, Mona Moor of great adventures, from Isle to Arn Ard Noshugi. The hill of the suck from Shuiga suck to the Shuiga Shalga, whither went the dams of Drum Darug from the wood eastward? The chariot head did pass into A Find to Cool Clocher. The confluence of the of Kurok, the head of the river, the hill of Bamba, where spears were wont to be, the hounds of Carpri were triumphant over the border borders of Tipra. Mungarge, and Tipra is an old Irish word for tubber, is the modern Irish word for a well, a sacred well. Many of the heroes of the pagans, the battles, the Italians, the great fires that were engaged in felling Kyle Cohen, delightful was the host of the fir volugs, fir volugs, fir volugs. When she had felled the beautiful wood, and having cleared its roots out of the ground before the end of one year, it was my, sorry, it was Bray. Mui, it was a flowery plain adorned with shamrocks. The moor of Talchin, and that is the rampart or the wall of Talchin, survives all time. In similarly, the Chower, uh, the Irish name for Tara, is apparently derived from uh, Cha Moor, uh, the the moor or the wall or rampart of Tia. The moor, the moor of Talchin survives all time in which she was buried without doubt, and a moor which conceals multitudes of dead, in which was buried Yochi Garov. Upon the moor of Yochi of Chiselstone, 
are the twenty mounds of the kings of Jower, and on the moor of his wife, there also are the twenty mounds of their queens. A kingly, uh, sorry, I can't read that word. Imshking for noble monster. I don't know what that word is. Yeah, it's a, it's not translated from the Irish. Uh, um, we could do with Morgan Daimler here to help us. A kingly imshking for noble monster by the kings of Chower on the north. The three mounds of Connacht almost a bat, bat, bat hyphen, and it doesn't say upon the forehead of the men of Olgen Macht. We have, says Conwell, documentary authority for stating that the Irish in pagan times had regal cemeteries in various parts of the island appropriated to the internment of the chiefs or princes of the different races who ruled either as sole monarchs or as provincial kings. This valuable authority is preserved in a tract called Shanachus na Relic, or the history of the cemeteries, being a fragment of the oldest and most celebrated Irish manuscript we possess, viz. Laura Mahira, and we have mentioned that many on many occasions, the Book of the Dun Cow, which is a collection of pieces in prose and verse compiled and transcribed at Clonmacnoise around AD 1100 by Mael Murray Machelachar, grandson of Con na Mocht, a distinguished writer of that great abode of learning. It's a very interesting, these names. Con na Mocht, right? Literally means con the poor. You know, have you ever heard that f- phrase, shan, shan van bocht, shan van vocht? Uh, con can also mean hound, the poor hound. Interesting. In quoting this tract, Dr. Petrie remarks that, quote, judging from its language, its age must be referred to a period several centuries earlier than that in which its transcriber flourished. It is also to be observed that this tract is glossed in its original, evidently by Mail Murray himself, and that such explanations of the transcriber are given within crotchets, both in the Irish text and the translation of, this, of, of, of it. From this venerable old authority, we cull the following extracts in which mention occurs of the cemetery of Talchin. These were the three chief cemeteries of Aaron before the faith, i.e. before the introduction of Christianity, viz., Crochu Bru, Talchen, Locher Alve, there you go, Paul Garron, Enoch Alve, Enoch Cooley, Enoch Colman, Chower Aaron. At Talchen, the kings of Ulster were used to bury, viz, all of Fola with his descendants down to Conchobar, who wished that he should be carried to a place between Slay and the sea with his face to the east on account of the faith which he had embraced, and that's in Lara Nahira. In Lara Nahira, there is also a tract on the death uh, and burial at Rathcrohan of Dahi, the last pagan monarch of Ireland, in which occurs a poem ascribed to Dorban, a poet of West Connacht, uh, from which the following three stanza, stanzas are extracted. The three cemeteries of the idolaters are idolaters, <laughs> pre-Christians, huh? Poor pagans getting a hard time in the, uh, in, the, in the writings of the monks. The three cemeteries of idolaters are the cemetery of Talchin, the select. And that is, of course, the area that we've been referring to uh, as Loch Crew, The ever clean cemetery of Crochen and the cemetery of Brew. Crochen being uh, Crochen E or Rathcrohan in Connacht in uh, modern day County Roscommon. Uh, and Brew being Brunabonia, Newgrange, Nowth and Douth, Sheed and Broga, etc. at uh, the bend of the Boyne here, close to Drogheda. The host of great Meath were buried in the middle of the lordly brew. The great Oltonians used to bury at Talchin with pomp. The true Oltonians before Conchobar were ever buried at Talchin until the death of that triumphant man through which they lost their glory. The poem in Laura Nahira is followed by a prose commentary both given by Moel Murray on the authority of the ancient accounts collected by Yochi, Olach, O'Kerin and Flan, from which we extracted the following passage, showing who were buried at Talchin. The chiefs of Ulster before Conchobar were buried at Talchin, viz. Olaf Fola and seven of his sons and grandsons, with others of the chiefs of Ulster, the nobles of the Tilda Danon, with the exception of seven of them who were interred interred at Talchin, were buried at Brew, and that of course is the tradition, i.e. Lu and A, O.E., son of Olive, Olivan, and Ogma and Carpery, son of Etain, i.e. the poetess, and Etain herself, and the Dagda and his three sons, i.e. Aid and Angus and Kermat. 
and a great number besides of the Tour de Danon and of the Fir Bullogs and of other persons also. And that's Laura Mahira, page 38, column 2. From this, it would appear that, in addition to the Oltonians being buried at Tulchin, seven of the Tuatha de Danann dynasty, whose names are given above, were also interred here. On the next page of our valuable old manuscript, alluding to the ancient uh, fairs held at the cemeteries, we have the following poetical enumeration of the mounds, cairns, or tombs to be found at each of the three cemeteries referred to. And here's the one that uh, I was on the scent of very much so for my Drone Henge book. 50 hills in each Enoch of them. 50 hills at Enoch Crochen and 50 hills at Enoch Tolchen and 50 at Enoch in Broga. And Enoch in Broga, the assembly site of uh, Brunebonia, which I hadn't read about in any of the modern books about Brunebonia, uh, which could refer to possibly the late Neolithic monument assembly there, which was undoubtedly used for very grand affairs including probably very public displays of, of the sort of things that we would expect from an Enoch horse racing and chariot racing, if chariots were a thing, perhaps not chariot racing, um, fighting, uh, music, poetry, political grandstanding, etc., etc. The ruins or sites of of more than half of the above number of cairns set down as being a Taljan can still be pointed out on the Loch Crew Hills. Out of the list of the ancient royal cemeteries of Ireland before given, the sites of only two, viz. Crohan, about the middle of the county Roscommon, and Brew in Meath, a few miles west of Drogheda, are definitely known. The sites of the remainder, so far as we know, have yet to be established. In the preceding extracts from the most ancient manuscripts we possess, we have so much definite information given as to that of Talchin that it appears to us almost impossible to doubt its existence on the Loch Crew Hills. By the way, I should tell you that this paper or this book uh, is Eugene Conwell's Tomb of the Olaf Fola is downloadable from the internet free as a PDF. So you might do your Google search and, and have a read of it when I'm uh, finished. In the preceding, blah, 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 blah. if Talchin was buried here, in whose memory the fair and games of Talchin were established by Lula Fada, whose death is recorded at 1829 BC, it must have been used as a cemetery for upwards of 18 centuries before the Christian era. But if we only date it as being used from the time of the name of the first on the list mentioned as interred here, viz. Olaf Fola, whose death is set down by the four masters as having occurred in 1277 BC, it must be 31 centuries and a half old. As to the period at which the cemetery of Talchin ceased to be used as such, it is here distinctly stated that it was used by the Oltonians up to the time of Concobar, who specified his wish to be buried elsewhere. Now, as Concobar or Conor Macnessa is set down in the generally received correct annals of Chirnock as having died AD 33 and Olaf Fola by the Four Masters at BC 1277, it is plain that the cemetery of Talchin must have been in actual use for at least uh, at least for nearly 13 centuries before the Christian era. And of course, we now know that it's likely to have been in use for about 35 centuries before the Christian era, when on the death of Concobar, it ceased to be used. Um, Christian era being that the era beginning at zero or 1 AD. As Concobar and Crimthon were the two kings of the two great dynasties reigning in Ireland at the commencement of the Christian period, and Crimthon being the first of his line, according to Shanachus Narellic, buried at Brew, we have a very clear view, as Mr. Ferguson points out, of the relative age and history of the two royal cemeteries of Meath. In fact, it was not until Talchin was abandoned that the kings began to bury at Brew in the neighbourhood of Drogheda. Who knows, perhaps that does uh, carry with it remembrance of the fact that Loch Crew is perhaps older than Brunebonia. In the poem before quoted, there is an epithet applied to the cemetery of Talchin, which strikes us as very remarkable. The line runs, the cemetery of Talchin, the select. Now, we think the epithet here applied to Talchin, and I won't be much longer, folks, because I do appreciate that we've been on for an hour and a quarter, uh, just in case you're sitting uncomfortably in your seats or you haven't topped up your dram lately. Uh, now, we think that the epithet here applied to Talchin will throw some light on the cause of the Ulster kings and chiefs coming so far, all the way from Awen, beside the present city of Armagh, to bury their dead at Talchin. For, probably in the whole island, there could not be found a more select and remarkable site 
than our ancient kings fixed upon, which they adopted the heights of that range of hills we now call Schliebnikalia for their future cemetery. Can't argue with that necessarily, although uh, you'd be hard pressed to uh, argue with a Sligo uh, man or woman who claims that the the beautiful cemeteries uh, there, especially uh, 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 Carol Keel, uh, might not present a little bit of competition for Loch Crew in that regard. From them, the mountains overhanging the bays of Carlingford and Sligo are visible, thus giving a telescopic view of Ireland from coast to coast at the narrowest part of the island. Moreover, persons well acquainted with the general face of the country are accustomed to point out from the peaks of Schlievnikalia, with the aid, of course, of a clear atmosphere, elevations in 18 out of the 32 counties of Ireland. This ceases to surprise us when we recollect that the square root of once and a half, there's definitely a typo there, that the square root of once and a half the height in feet of any elevation on the globe's surface is equal to the distance of the offing or sensible horizon in miles. God, my head's fried. Hence, the highest peak of Schliebnikalia, having an altitude of 904 feet, must command a view of at least 37 miles all around. In a perfectly clear horizon, and atmospheric refra refraction will increase this distance by about three miles. Now, taking Schliebnikalia as the center, here's where the, the, old, the old antiquarians get get into their heads so much and, and away from the uh, the heart of the matter. And with a radius of 40 miles sweeping a circle on the map of Ireland, we find that this circle will include, will include the counties of Meath, West Meath, Longford, Cavan and Monaghan, the greater portions of Dublin, Kildare, Kings County, Roscommon, Leitrim, Fermanagh, Armagh and Louth, and will include small portions or nearly touch the confines of Wicklow, Queen's County, Galway, Sligo, Tyrone and Down. Following out the same process of calculation, any mountain attaining to the height of 2,000 feet under favourable circumstances might be visible from Schliebnikalia, if not more than 92 miles distant. And this would include every mountain of 2,000 feet and upwards in height in every county in Ireland, except in Cork and Kerry. When the sun shines out resplendently over these hills, chasing away the gloom of darkness, which occasionally and often very suddenly obscures their summits, the gorgeous panorama displaying a profuse wealth of natural attractions is seen with great distinctness of outline and presents a prospect probably one of the most diversified and beautiful in the whole island. Here he gets poetic and he's not wrong. It's beautiful up there. If you ever get the chance, COVID disappears. Things, when people can travel again, Come to Ireland, come to see Loch Crew. Nature seems to have lavished her choicest treasures upon the scene. And the magnificent combination of receding eminences and distant lakes and gracefully undulating plains could not fail to quicken the imagination to a profound sense of solemn grandeur. What wonder then that one old bardic chronicler, as we have seen, should have called this place the Fair Hill Talchin, and uh, another should have described it as the cemetery of Talchin, the elect. I think we will leave the reading there for this evening. Thank you all for your patience. And indeed, uh, thank you all for your forbearance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the first part of tonight's episode was very difficult. I have to admit, uh, I, I didn't realize that I would be uh, so emotional about it, but we have in fact lost uh, one of our Tua, one of our regular viewers and it is sad and it is a shock and it is particularly a shock that Kelly who was only 63 was uh, taken from us quickly and suddenly without warning snatched away from us only the day after she had been commenting here on uh, Live Irish Myths sending us her love so I hope that you completely and I know that you do I've seen some of the comments um, I hope that you think that what happened at the beginning of the episode was a fitting tribute to Kelly and uh, that uh, her memory will live on, um, especially to those of us who actually met her uh, and who know uh, of the warmth of her personality and her smile and her slightly rascal nature, uh, which is something uh, which I think, you know, um, it, well, I think it brought all the more affection for her, you know, Um and in the meantime, I should also say, look, let's do our best to keep a, an eye out for each other, not forgetting that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that 
careless actions on our behalf could result in the demise of someone else. Uh, so let us all do what we would want for ourselves, which is to keep everybody safe and well. A special hug to you all tonight. Uh, it's been a difficult one. Hopefully, you know, as I say, that's life, isn't it? Um, hopefully we won't have too many more like that. Um, but uh, do look after each other and do care for each other. You know, send out a uh, uh, a compassionate and caring word to your neighbours and friends who may be struggling with loneliness, depression, who may be suffering with, uh, I don't know, some of them may be even suffering from hunger. Um, but just keep an eye out for everybody. Keep an eye out for each other. You're all very good. You've been a wonderful community. Never expected, as I've said repeatedly, when this began, that such a lovely, real lovely, warm, close group of very nice human beings would grow up around it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I had this idea that I'd be just looking at a camera phone and sort of speaking into a void. And uh, apart from the first episode, when, when it was it was a funny one, the first one, I've always felt that I've been speaking to a room full of lovely people. So take it easy. And uh, I'm going to leave the videos online, uh, much as I'm a little bit embarrassed by my own uh, lack of composure at the beginning. But at the same time, I would want Kelly to know how I feel about her. And I know that you've always uh, felt the same. Some of you, I, I imagine, may have met her uh, and uh, may have been subject to her many charms. Uh, but Kelly, we won't forget you in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Good night, everybody. God bless. Uh, no matter who your god or gods are, uh, may they take care of you in the meantime. Uh, at some point this week, I must live up to my promises of another book talk episode, which I keep failing on. Although last Thursday, we had the premiere of Podcast 13, uh, the first uh, interview with Richard Moore, the first conversation with Rich Richard Moore, the second of those, just to remind you, is on Patreon uh, at the moment for Mythical Ireland patrons. So take care, uh, have a, a good night and have a good week, and we'll see you all uh, next week. In the meantime... Uh, Slongafol, Kolosov, uh, sound sleep. Ikawa is good night, only if it's night for you where, wherever you are. And of course, most, most importantly of all, Tog Kabugay. Take it easy.